My first conversation with Prabhupada was after the park. Uh, Prabhupada and the devotees rolled up the rug and left the park. And I had never heard of Hare Krishna before. It wasn't a popular thing as it is now. And some stranger came over to me and asked me if I'd like to go to the temple to see the Swami. And I didn't know what that was, but I intuitively felt there was something there. And so I went to the temple, and the first thing I saw, besides the devotees chanting in front of Prabhupada's, what they called the dais at that time, his Vyasasana, um, two devotees, one devotee came over and gave me a japati, which I immediately started eating. And while I was eating it, two other devotees were talking between themselves, and I overheard. And one of them was saying, the Swami just said that whenever devotees fight, it should be taken like clouds passing by. Because when clouds pass by, you hardly even notice it, or you don't notice it. So it should be taken as insignificant. And I thought that was pretty amazing, especially since at that time it was the Vietnam War and so many protests and everything was in turmoil. So I thought it was amazing. Sometime later I got to go on a walk with Prabhupada on his famous morning walks. And, and uh, at that time I had become a little bit known for distributing his books. And um, I think it was in the same year, later in that same year, 1972. And uh, the, someone had said, Prabhupada, to, Tripper Ardas is here, and he's distributing your books. And Prabhupada turned to me and opened his eyes quite wide, and, and he quoted the verse from Bhagavad Gita that no one has ever will ever be more dear to me than one who preaches the message of Bhagavad Gita. So he encouraged me along those lines, and I was already enthusiastic about that by his grace. So that um, further catapulted me into the kind of service that. I did for quite a long time in his manifest presence, distributing his literature and inspiring, inspiring others to do so. And I remember asking him a question at the end of the talk. He asked if there was anybody who had questions. And I said, how does one become sincere? Because I, in my own mind, I had viewed that sincerity was a key quality in achieving self-realization. And so he said, you become sincere by being sincere. And he said, it, it, it's, you, you, you just have to want this Krishna consciousness. You have to sincerely want to surrender to the spiritual master and to Krishna. And he talked a little bit about <clears throat> those things. And uh, I remember that, and I remember that on at least two occasions later on, once in Africa and once in India, when I came into the room to see Srila Prabhupada and there were some life members in the room, he would introduce me and he would say, this is my disciple Bhagavat Das. And he is very sincere. And that struck me. It touched my heart that Prabhupada always remembered that I wanted to be sincere. And then somebody asked, invited me to come up to see the Swami in his apartment. So um, I went there and there were about 10 or 15 devotees chanting Japa, although I didn't know what they were chanting. And then Prabhupada was sitting in front of his little oval altar, which you saw in the Lilamrita, which is surrounded by the tall gladiola plants. And he offered his obeisances to one of the pictures of Krishna on the altar. And I was an impersonalist, and so I thought he was offering his obeisances to the floor because everything is God. And then he went into his back room, which was called the greeting room or the sitting room. And uh, somebody asked me to go back there. So um, I didn't know anything. I was just following the requests. And in that room, I noticed that Prabhupada was um, reciprocating with everybody as they reciprocated with him. Whoever shook his hand, he shook their hand. Whoever 
uh, did that, he did that. As they did with him, he was with them. With them. Um, so then he said to me, um, he said to everyone actually, he said, he sat back, he was sitting on his mat, and he sat back and he said, we are eternal and everything around us is temporary. And uh, because he is the uh, external manifestation of super soul, you feel the power of the super soul speaking, and so it had a tremendous influ influence, just that statement. And then uh, he asked me if I live nearby, and I said, oh yes, I live very near, because I thought I was all-pervading. But actually, I lived an hour and a half away, and so he said, oh, very good, then you can come for morning classes. And although it would be very difficult, especially taking an hour and a half train ride from the Bronx to downtown Manhattan, by the power of his in invitation, I felt obligated to do it, and I began taking the train in the mornings. So that was my first experience with him. Well, what stands out in my mind on the morning walks is that Prabhupada always used to ask me, so, Triparimars, what are they saying? That was his standard kind of question to me. Because he knew I was always in the field, hmm, preaching to people, distributing the literature and so forth. And, that I would need arguments to, to counteract. And he was curious what their arguments were. So then I would give them one or, uh, each time I would give one or two of their arguments and Prabhupada would defeat it in an enlightening way. And, uh, mind? well, some, yeah. Um, once in Mayapur I told Prabhupada that, well, they're saying that we should use our intelligence to understand and figure out the, uh, the uh, absolute knowledge or the, or the truth of life and apply ourselves with all of our God-given type of reasoning, as if to say Krishna consciousness was deviating from reasoning. It does go beyond reasoning, but it picks up where reasoning leaves off. At any rate, I, I, I presented something like that, uh, an argument to that effect, and Prabhupada immediately replied, well, okay, so use your intelligence, read the Bhagavad Gita, study Bhagavad Gita. And uh, usually in short bursts like that, he would come back and, and give the response. One time in Vrindavan, he asked me what they're saying, and I said to Prabhupada, they're saying that we are parasites, hmm? that we're simply leeching off the society, and um, in this way, carrying on, but we're not contributing anything. And then he said, so? Stop giving. And then he, everyone was silent. He said, but you can't. That's all he said, but it was very profound. And I appreciated the point that, the point that it's, that uh, you say we're only parasites, then we say then stop giving. But someone else is supplying us. This Sankirtan movement is going on, not by, because you're supporting us. You're benefiting by participating. The support is coming from above. Krishna's in the background, he's supplying, he's supporting. Hmm. So we were all sitting there, and Srila Prabhupada was looking at all of us, and he picked up a set of beads, and he said, whose bead? So I had recognized they were mine. I said, they're mine, Srila Prabhupada. And then he turned and he said, and what is his name? Because they had the list of names in the book. Aravinda said, his name is Bhagavat Das. And he looked and he laughed. He said, oh, Bhagavat Das. And it was almost as if, like, he knew me or he was waiting for me to come or something. And, and uh, he said, oh, Bhagavat Das. He said, there are two things. There is the book Bhagavat. And there is the person Bhagavat those who follow the scriptures like Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. He said, and you are Bhagavad Das, and you shall serve them both. So then he gave me the beads, and he, but he had the beads in his hand, he said, now, what are the four rules? Right? Re, you know, said the four rules. And he said, and uh, how many rounds a day must you chant? 
So at the time, I had been chanting 20 rounds a day as an austerity. I wanted to chant more rounds. So I said, you're supposed to chant 16 rounds a day, but I am chanting 20. And Prabhupada looked at me, frowned like, don't be so egotistical. And then he gave me the beads. And so I had the beads and I was chanting like this in front of Srila Prabhupada. And then this devotee, he picked up the next beads and it was Subrata. So he said, whose beads? And Subrata said, mine. So he went through the thing with him and told him what the name was and all that. And then he went to give him the beads and he noticed he didn't have neck beads on. So just as Subrata went to get the beads, he took the beads back and said, where are your neck beads? And then he turned and he looked at me. I didn't have neck beads on. And I had the beads like this and I took my beads and I went like this because I had waited a year and a half to get initiated and I didn't want him to take the beads back. So I went like this and he said, he has no beads either. But then he didn't chastise us and he turned to read Dayananda and Aravinda and he said, and Sridham, Sridham was also there. And he said, you are the senior disciples. You know that they can't get initiated without beads. Why don't they have neck beads? They are new, and you are senior, and you have been around, and you know all this. Why, why don't they have beads? And so everyone, we're sorry, we're sorry. We didn't see it. Everyone was so busy because of the lecture and the TV and everything. And so can you, we'll, we'll make sure that they have the beads before the fire yoga tomorrow. And so he said, all right. All right. But before fire yoga, they must have beads. So I went into the temple and I noticed that there were um, lots of pots because the engagement was right after lunch. And usually somebody brings the pots upstairs back to Prabhupada's quarters and washes them. But this time it was a rush. So I offered to bring the pots up to the apartment. And when I got up there, Achutananda, who was in the kitchen, said, you know, you're not supposed to be up here unless you're initiated. So I was so embarrassed and so flustered, I didn't know what to do. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye that in Prabhupada's greeting room, he was sitting there. So I didn't know what to say, so I just turned to Prabhupada and said, I didn't mean to say it, but I said, oh yes, yeah, so that's what I came up to talk to you about, initiation. So he was very calm and serene about it. And he said, uh, can you follow the principles? And I said yes, although at that time I only had given up smoking. But I said, yes, I could do it. And um, he said, all right, you can be initiated in two weeks with Bob. And then uh, the day before initiation, um, I didn't have any beads yet. <laughs> so I was streaking beads. Um, see, in those days we didn't have Tulsi, so we would all buy these red beads at Tandy's um, hobby store and string them ourselves. And I was asking some of the devotees what was the meaning of initiation, and they were saying, <laughs> they were saying, uh, it means that you agree to serve the spiritual master, you accept him as God, and you agree to serve him for the rest of this life and eternally thereafter. Oh, okay. And then I thought I would dress for the occasion, since it was a special occasion, so I wore my tight black jeans and black turtleneck shirt. Uh, then at the initiation ceremony, I didn't know Prabhupada's pranam mantra yet. So when he handed me the beads and told me to bow down, I didn't know what to say about being bowed down. So he said Nama, and then I said Nama, and he said Om, I said Om, he said Vishnu Padaya. And in that way we went through the mantra. And then he said, uh, your name is Jadarani. And Jadarani is the original queen in the Jadu dynasty. And Krishna appears in a particular family, although he's eternal, to glorify that family of devotees. And he appears just like the sun. The sun is always there, but it appears in the day and disappears at night. So Krishna appeared like that. Um, so I was honored to get the name. In the picture, Prabhupada's not present. Uh, it's in the courtyard of the Radha Dhamma, Radha, uh, excuse me, Krishna Balaram Temple. And, um, and Satsarup Maharaj performed this fire sacrifice, and then Prabhupada went to his quarters and gave me the mantra and the danda. And, and so forth, and some instructions to preach. Not so much the taking of sannyas, accepting of sannyas from Prabhupada. Um, 
this is what led up to it, I think, that it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting to me, at any rate. That year, 1975, all 1974, I had been traveling as a brahmachari and preaching throughout um, America and organizing book distribution. And then I came to Mayapur. And I had no GBC because the fellow who was my GBC in Los Angeles had left and I had been sent to Australia at the end of 1973 and then in 1970, beginning of 74 I went to India at Prabhupada's invitation for his festival. And then I was there and I thought, what do I do? Should I go back to Los Angeles or what? And I had an idea to organize book distribution in a certain way and uh, I never asked anybody about it, checked with anybody about it. Ramaswar and I kind of had the idea and, then, and he and I brainstormed about it. And so anyway, I went back to America and I started traveling and preaching and organizing book distribution without, in effect, any kind of authorization from Prophet's leading uh, governing body commissioners. And uh, so by the time 1975 came around and I came back to Mayapur, the, the GBC, they called me in and asked me, who is your GBC? And I said, I don't know, I, I don't have a GBC, I guess. And I, to be honest with you, at that time I never even thought about it. I didn't even really understand what the GBC was. And I didn't realize you had to have one. And uh, and I wasn't really trying to buck the system. It just kind of worked out like that. So they were insistent I had to have one. And to be honest, I thought, I was a little naive, but then I got a little insight. I thought, some of these men, maybe they want me on their party. Because <laughs> sometimes they could be a little territorial. And uh, so then they, they made me choose which one I would take if I had to have one. So I picked one who was a little low-key and didn't have a big, uh, big profile. And they were all quite shocked. Why you picked him? He's not very fired up or something. I think is what they thought. At any rate, they went to Prabhupada and they used to do that after their meetings. And they would go and all of their resolutions would be read to Prabhupada and he'd say, yes, this one, adjust that one, this one is not good. So they came to me, they brought up my name and they said, there's this Tripura Aridas. And Prabhupada said, what has he done? Hmm? They said, well, Prabhupada, uh, with a quiver in their voice, then he, he doesn't have any GBC and he's traveling around and raising so much money. And then he, he cut them off and said, he's distributing my books, he doesn't need a GBC. That was the end of the story. And how I know about it is because three of them came to me afterwards and they, they apologized to me. I said, they're not apologize to me, you're the GBC. You know, I, I had respect for them all. But they, they were nice enough to tell me that, that Prabhupada said he doesn't need a GBC. So I kind of in that way, I kind of came directly under Prabhupada in my own mind, and I think in the minds of a number of leading men also. Therefore, they didn't really complain too much when I used to force my way under the morning walk, or as there I was Prabhupada's main instrument at the time for distributing books. Prabhupada gave me encouraging words along those lines in 1977 when he had fallen ill and the festival was ending in Mayapur and he was going to go to Vrindavan and then he decided not to go to Vrindavan. So I went to him with Pancha Dravidya Maharaj and I said, Prabhupada, you know, I'm not interested in going to Vrindavan for the rest of the festival. He said, why not? I said, because you are the festival and without you there's no meaning to Vrindavan in the festival there. So you are staying here, I would like to stay here with you. So Prabhupada said, no, you are a preacher. He really appreciated the sentiment. Hmm? I felt he deeply appreciated it. He said, no, you are a preacher. You should go. Hmm? So, um, shortly thereafter then, some other devotees came, and uh, Ramaswar came, and he had the first little publication of how many books had been printed in how many languages. Hmm? So, Prabhupada was so encouraging. There were 64 million books had been distributed to date, and Ramaswar was giving the report, so many of us were sitting there. And then um, Prabhupada dismissed us all. And then he called me back, hmm? and he pointed to the 64 million, he said, this is all your credit, 64 million. <laughs> I thought, Prabhupada, this is all your credit. You are so encouraging to us. So he said a couple of nice things like that about me. You don't need a GBC, he doesn't need a GBC, all this credit is his. And I'm sure you know he said about others in different ways also. And for them it was true. For me it was just encouraging words that he was, he was giving. But um, in this was 
this was later, but in 1975, when they said he, when he said he doesn't need a GBC, that year they passed a resolution that no one will take sannyas unless they're recommended by the GBC and they wait for one year. And um, so that was approved by Prabhupada. And um, then in Vrindavan, in 1975, Prabhupada, of course, went to Vrindavan, and I was there, and I was very, very ill, very sick. But I was very enthusiastic to con carry on. I had amoebic dysentery. I weighed 118 pounds. My ribs were sticking out everywhere. And the truth, the Swami suggested, you know, you should take sannyas. You're a very, very renounced kind of person, he said. So others had suggested, and Ramaswar had already tried to get Prabhupada to give me sannyas earlier. And so I didn't think much of it, but I got some deep realization when Prabhupada opened the Krishna Balaram temple. We had all worked so hard to sell books and raise money, and others directly raise money for the opening of the temple. It was a great struggle for Prabhupada. And I saw him op doing that arti to Krishna Balaram. Hmm? At that time, I was so, so, uh, so touched, so deeply touched, that, that such a wonderful thing Prabhupada wanted so much. It's been done, and somehow we've been instruments in this. The glory of watching him offer the arti to Krishna Balaram. It was so wonderful that I couldn't... Vishaka was behind me, and you know, she was a photographer for the preaching and so forth. And there was a, quite a push and a shove you know, to get close to Prabhupada and, and witness this. And I was pushing and shoving, and she was behind me, and she was trying to, to pull, and she said, Maharaj, it's for the preaching, you know, because its preaching was so important to get forward. And she went on the one and wanted me to let her in front of her, and I, <laughs> I said, the hell with the preaching, you know, <laughs> I'm not moving from here, you know, and watch this. <laughs> Moment in eternity, Prabhupada offering Arctic to Krishna and Balaram. Anyway, I got so much inspiration at that time. Hans Aluda was there and tears were flowing from his eyes like anything and standing next to me. And I was also choked up hmm, and crying. And I thought I must take all formal steps to dedicate myself to Prabhupada in every way. So I went to Prabhupada and they didn't even want to let me in, whoever his secretary was, but I got in anyway. And I told him, Prabhupada, I think I'd like to take sannyas, but I was so submissive. My nature was, I'm, you know, known to be very independent in some ways, and like a maverick and rebellious, but really, there's both sides to me, and to Prabhupada, I was very, very, very submissive. Hmm? And I was afraid to ask anything of him, to ask anything, you do something for me, you, you give me sannyas. If you don't want it, I want the message I was trying to send, I don't want it. But I'm thinking <laughs> that maybe you'll want it, and I want it only because I have some idea that it will draw me closer to you by making that kind of commitment. So I tried to explain all these things to Prabhupada when he asked why you should take it. And he kind of played with me. He said, so, he said, you are, he knew me, of course, and he said, so you are uh, Brahmachari? And I said, I think, oh, Prabhupada, it's me, Triparari, it's me, I was thinking in my mind. And I said, I had a wife when I joined, but then she left and said, she said oh, Vana Prasta, then. <laughs> and so he was kind of playing with me and he was, he said, so you will be taking, if you take sannyas, then what if you give it up? I said, Prabhupada, I would never do that. I thought, you know, I, I, this is part of love, I want to do this for you. He said, others have said, and they have gone. And I thought, well, maybe he doesn't want. So I kind of thought, I, gosh, I don't want to, force my idea on the higher. This is not bhakti. Bhakti is to take their idea and, 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 and do their bidding, not to impose my idea upon them. So, I, I went a little further and explained in relation to preaching, and mostly it was hidden motive, as I said, I want to get into your quarters whenever I can, and, and I just feel I want to be as closely connected with you as possible, and you can get one initiation, you can get two, three. So I want all three. So then he said, I, I backed off. I said, well, anyway, Prabhupada, you know, I don't want to push it and anything. And he didn't say no. He didn't say yes. He was kind of amused by it. And then I thought, I should do the right thing. And so I went to every GBC member hmm, who was there, and I told them, I'm thinking of taking sannyas. And, and they had just passed a rule that you couldn't do that. But they had also just been told he doesn't need a GBC. So I guess they... They took that to heart, and none of them, none of them opposed me except Brahmananda. <laughs> He's the only one. Prabhupada gave this order that it has to be recommended, and and I guess my adherence to them at that time was maybe a little bit superficial because I heeded everyone's advice except Brahmananda's. 
He said no, and everyone else said yes. Or maybe I just took it the majority roles here. And, and when I went to Tamal Krishnamurish, he had heard Tripuramurish was talking to different GPCs about taking sannyas. And when it came to him, and Haikima asked me, he said, yes, you should do it immediately. Let's go to Prabhupada. So he dragged me back down to, to Srila Prabhupada. And then he said, Prabhupada Tripuramurish wants to take sannyas. And all of us think it is a wonderful idea. So Prabhupada says, then tomorrow he will take sannyas. Hmm? So we kind of, my sannyas was kind of in violation of the GBC resolution in a sense. Then Srila Prabhupada asked if we had any questions again, as he did after the lecture. So I had been studying, I had, think I had read the Bhagavad Gita, that little blue one we had. I think by that time I had written, read it about 12 or 14 times. I was a very avid reader. And one of my favorite parts was the modes of material nature. And being very philosophical in nature, I wanted to understand some of the more refined and subtle points. And so I said to him, I'm confused because <clears throat> throughout your books and in your lectures, you say that when you become a devotee, you're on the transcendental platform. But at the same time, you talk about being affected by the modes of material nature. And although I'm a devotee, and I'm practicing the principles of devotional service, and experiencing a certain amount of transcendental pleasure, at the same time, I feel affected by the modes of material nature. So how is it that I could be on the transcendental platform and still be affected by the modes of material nature? And he smiled. He liked that question. He saw that it was thoughtful and introspective. And he said, that is a very good question. And he said, it is just like being on a boat. He said, when you're on the boat, no one can say you're not on the boat. You're on the boat. He said, but when you sail on the boat, sometimes very big waves will come and rock the boat. And so your position on the boat will not be very steady. He said, those waves are the modes of material nature and the boat is the transcendental platform. You're on the transcendental platform, but sometimes the waves of material nature rock the boat and your position is not steady. He said, so how will you become steady? He said, then you have to learn from the captain of the boat, that is the spiritual master, how to steer the boat. And if one learns expertly from the captain how to steer the boat, then even in the greatest storm, your position in the boat will become steady. He said, so similarly, on the transcendental platform, if you learn from the spiritual master how to steer the boat of transcendence through the ocean of material life, and you will become steady even in the greatest storm of the modes of material nature. I was extremely impressed at how Prabhupada had taken a complex situation and explained it with a very simple analogy. Uh, one analogy he gave was um, uh, in 1906 or uh, 66 or 67, he began his Prahlad Maharaj series, when Prahlad would speak to his classmates when his teachers were out. And one example was about, um, in an airplane, you have a driver and a motor. Without the motor, the plane doesn't run. And without the driver, even with the motor, the plane doesn't run. So without the soul and the body, even if you have all the mechanical arrangements, the body doesn't work. And then he said, if you take a teeny drop of poison, like tomain poison, even though the body is so big and so complicated, if you put one small drop of tomain poisoning in it, life is finished. So why not, if you have a little tiny soul, one ten thousandth of the tip of the hair, if that's in the body, it brings the whole body to life. I asked him a question about sickness because many of the devotees in my party were getting worn down and 
and sick and there was some notion going around that because we interacted in a sense intimately with many secular people with bad habits in a, in a, in a non-devotional, at least overtly, context. We were dressed in secular clothing and meet someone on the street and shake their hand or pat them on the back and they blow smoke in their face. And so there's some type of intimate exchange in and around uh, the, the context of preaching. But sometimes it wasn't so overtly that. And, and um, we were booksellers in people's minds. And at any rate, I asked that if because we're getting, some of them getting sick, maybe they're taking some karma from the people and Prabhupada. He, he, he came back pretty strongly to me on that occasion, saying you can never become infected by anything by performing Sankirtan. Other others will be, their infection will be counteracted. You cannot become implicated. So this is the real I'd, I'd principle of accepting service. It, it, uh, their reactions shouldn't so much show up on you. They should become purified of those reactions. Well, after a couple of paintings where the proportions were wrong, he taught me a system. He gave me some instructions on how to make the painting more accurate. And um, that was called the grid system. And he taught me about, say, the picture is in the glass. The picture always that he gave me was in a frame with glass. So you, uh, with some kind of marker or paintbrush, you divide the picture in half, and then that, those two in half, and those two in half. So you get 16 lines across and 16 lines down. And uh, so I would, instead of trying to do the whole picture at once, you just do one box at a time. And that's how it came out more accurate. And the first painting I did like that was a painting of his Guru Maharaj, which he gave me. And uh, he had a little bit long hair and a beard also. And I was surprised because Prabhupada was a spiritual master and he was clean shaven. So he told me that for four months of the year called Chaturmasya, where devotees did austerity, he didn't shave at that time. And uh, that was the painting I did. I remember coming to his room. At that time I was appointed Prabhupada in, in Rindavan Prabhupada heard that they wouldn't give us the permit to put the building up in Bombay. So he had asked Balavanta what we should do, and Balavanta said that we should do civil disobedience like Lord Chaitanya. And so Prabhupada said, good. So then he demanded that all the devotees that were here from all over the world should come to Bombay and start preaching and do Sankirtan and civil disobedience. I remember he was very proud of Balavanta. He said, just see this man's intelligence. Just see how intelligent he is. He has understood. Prabhupada was very appreciative that he immediately came up with a spiritual solution. So we all went, everybody, all the Australian devotees, all the European devotees, all the American devotees, all the African devotees, everybody went to Bombay right after the Vrindavan festival. And uh, there we were in Bombay. And my job, I was given the responsibility to go to speak with the ministers in order to get the products, the uh, food. We were going to get food from America shipped into India to distribute to the people. So I was requested to go and speak with the different government officials to arrange permits for that. And then I was told to also collect donations of food and money so we could distribute prasadam to the public. And so that was what I did. And every day when I came home, I had to go all the way downtown on the train and come all the way back. When I came home in the evening, Prabhupada awaited my report. 
So, what is the news of today? So I said, well, I went and I collected $1,500 from this man and well, rupees, 1,500 rupees from this man and uh, collected the sacks of grain from this person and this and that. And he was very good, very good. He was always pleased to see any progress that we made. And uh, then he would uh, ask me about the ministers whom I had spoken to and what I had done. One day I actually got to speak to the chief minister of the state of Maharashtra. And he was very pleased. He was, he was just beaming that, you know, here my American disciples are speaking with the highest government officials and arranging for so many things to be done. He really appreciated how resourceful we were and how adamant we were and uh, tenacious about serving our spiritual master and getting to see all the different people that were involved. And he would, uh, he would praise me for my accomplishments and I always felt so, you know, good that, you know, I was doing my spiritual master's work. And uh, I remember one incident in which he had given me money to put in the bank. He gave me the bank form and the money. I just took the money in the bank form and I put it in either my pocket or my bag and he said, don't you count it? So I said, well, you gave me the money, Srila Prabhupada. He said, no. Whenever giving or taking money, always count. And I, I was thinking about, ain't this was just like you know a mundane affair in one sense. But yet it was Krishna's money, which was very important to Srila Prabhupada. But his point was that you never know what could happen. And so he, he felt like it wasn't just in matters of spiritual that he was training us. He was training us in, in mundane matters as well. He felt that all of the, you know, we were on one level educated but on another level, totally uneducated about the practicalities of the material world. And he was very tolerant with my um, lack of any kind of consciousness, what to speak of Krishna consciousness. It was a very old picture, you can imagine, if it was a picture of his Guru Maharaj. And so the, the details weren't clear. So in my painting, I didn't paint fingernails. And he brought it to my attention. I said, well, I didn't see them. Dumb, a dumb answer. And he said, all right as, you know, like I was saying something very intelligent. <laughs> but everybody knows what fingernails look like. So he, he was very, uh, very patient and tolerant. But then, of course, I realized that I should put them on. And then um, as the painting was coming to an end, um, I painted white tilak because the picture was black and white. And our tilak was also white because there was no Gopi Chandan at that time. So we all used Fuller's Earth, <coughs> which one of the devotees bought at some hardware store. And so he told me to make the tilak yellowish and also to make a bright garland and uh, not to put a halo around him. Perhaps I'd already put one, and he said not to put one. And then on a small piece of paper, which subsequently he did for many paintings after that, he would write in his own handwriting on a small, long piece of paper the mantra of that particular painting. So he wrote the pranam mantra of his Guru Maharaj and told me to write that at the bottom. And then when it was completely finished, he made a big announcement. There was maybe 10 devotees in, the, in his room, and he said, you have brought me Vaikuntha. <laughs> Although he had brought us Vaikuntha, he said that. Sometimes I talk with him about book distribution. I remember when, once I remember Gopa Vrindapal, he wanted to organize book distribution in a systematic way and train the men and women to um, conduct themselves in a particular way. And so he was in Vrindavan and he was pushing me, let's go and see Prabhupada and let's talk to him about it. And I was a little reluctant. And. Uh, 
for some reason I, I didn't want to do it. And not that I didn't want to go and talk to Prabhupada, I'd take any excuse any, to, to go there. But um, I put him off and um, then I heard that Prabhupada was going to cook that day. So I said, I'm going to go down there, invited or not, witness Prabhupada cooking. So I shaved up and got all clean and went down. And Prabhupada was taking massage and he said, so why, why have you come? You have a film question? I said, well, Prabhupada, I heard that you were going to cook. So I just wanted to come and, and help you cook or watch you cook and I thought that would be a very um, enlivening experience. He said, no, they are cooking nicely. He said, I am a sannyasi, I can cook with wood, he said. And he started to preach to me about what it means to be a sannyasi, to be independent and so forth. He meant I could live in the forest and be independent of all this. They're making a nice arrangement, I'm accepting it. And then, I guess maybe Gopal heard I had gone to see Prabhupada, and so he came in. And then he brought it up. So I'm like, well, we're here, let's see what he says. And he presented his idea, and Prabhupada, while appreciating it very much, his sincerity and his concern for making preaching very nice, he said it's a little artificial. Mm -hmm. And then I think uh, Gopal Paul brought up something about the Tamal Krishnamurti had organized along these lines by making some kind of quota system that a certain amount should be, books should be sold or money collected and it should be organized in that way. So I guess he was again pushing that there must be some place for this. Then Prabhupada said, that is Tamal Krishnamurti's concoction. <laughs> and um, I think he went on to say that, that still there's, there may be some place for that to inspire the devotees, but his main point at the time was that preaching was a spontaneous affair. And he referred to me, he said, just like Arthur Parai Maharaj, Krishna is giving him so many things to say within his heart, and he's saying them, and books are selling. So each devotee will get inspiration from within, from within their heart, and this way Krishna consciousness will be spread. And really that's the way Prabhupada spread Krishna consciousness, by wherever he saw Krishna manifesting and, 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 and leading, even if it was in the hearts of his own devotees, then he went in that direction. He considered that they're chanting sincerely and practicing, so something must be coming. Hmm? So when he saw a certain in inspired side of his disciples even, they had some idea, they wanted to do something, then he would say, yeah, we'll start a temple over there. Something that was all planned out, and uh, he had a notebook that he was always uh, referring to. Hmm? But uh, Krishna was leading, and sometimes leading in the hearts of his, even his disciples. Hmm? So he was so attentive to that, this idea of Mahabhagavata, of course, that you can, you'll see Krishna everywhere, in everything. Hmm? The beginning devotees, they'll think that I'm a devotee, everyone's a demon. And the higher devotee will think, I'm a demon, everyone's a devotee. <laughs> I'm a servant. Hmm? Sometimes Prabhupada would come over when I would paint and give other instructions. He, he'd squat in that typical Indian way and give instructions like um, make the palms pink or um, make something else some other way. He'd come and kneel and give instructions. Or sometimes he would just come by and look and I would just ask him philosophical questions. Like for example, he'd be lecturing about um, how the goddess of fortune was born out of the churning of the milk ocean. Now that's pretty far out. So uh, I'd, see, I'd see him standing there behind me as I was painting, and I'd just turn around and say, how could that have happened? So Prabhupada said, you should just think, all right, I don't understand something now. He explained it a little bit, but still it's beyond the mind. So he said, you should just think, all right, I don't understand now, but later on the understanding will come. Then, on another occasion, Prabhupada asked Satsarupa Maharaj to go and get Tamal Krishna to come to the room. And I was just coming back from downtown, it was in the evening, and I was coming to give my report. So as I was going to Prabhupada's room, I saw Satsarupa Maharaj coming down and he said, have you seen Tamal Krishna go so I said, no, I just, just came back from downtown. I said, I, I think he must be in his room. So he said, okay. So he went over to his room. And I went up to Prabhupada's room, and when I opened the door, 
I saw that there was about four life members in the room with Prabhupada. So Prabhupada saw me and he said, come in, sit down. I said, well, you're busy now, Prabhupada, with these men. I'll, I'll come back later. He said, no, come in and sit down. So I thought, oh boy, all right. So I went inside, I went over to the corner and I sat down. So then Tamal Krishna opened the door and he saw the men and Prabhupada said, you, come in, sit down. And he came in and he sat down. And the two of us are sitting there for the next half hour or so, Prabhupada just kept speaking to these Indian gentlemen. Didn't say a word to us. Preaching. And then they all, you know, thanked Prabhupada, offered obeisances, got up and walked out. So when they left, Prabhupada said to us, if you do not come here in the evening and listen to me preach to these gentlemen, then how will you learn how to preach? You must come and sit here and listen to me preach so that you learn the art of how to explain this philosophy to such uh, important and wealthy men in the community. You know, so here again, Prabhupada was teaching, you know, he, he was training everything. It was just constant education. And he saw that we were going to be his leaders in, on some level or another. And therefore, he wanted us to learn. Prabhupada's philosophy came to us in waves because he would speak every morning and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evenings. And then we would meet him on so many other occasions, particularly after I began painting in his quarters, there was lots of interaction. And we heard not only from him instructions, but the other devotees, we would all repeat him as soon as we heard an instruction. Um, but because we were dull, the, even we would hear so many things, they registered in their own time. Um, once I heard from the devotees that we couldn't um, lick stamps or um, lick envelopes. And so I asked Prabhupada, I heard this, and uh, why is that? Why do you say that the mouth is a dirty place? So he said, well, so many things are always coming and going. It's one of the nine gates of the body, and so it's considered a dirty place. Another time I was, um, I used to clean the altar room before I started painting. And um, in April, uh, Prabhupada had Govindadasi and Gursundar introduce the first, oh, the second Iskan Artik. First they started in San Francisco, which was simply a large tray with a small Jewish votive candle with the Hebrew letters still on the glass. So the first person on the line, there was a line of devotees in front of the Sankirtan painting, the, not Sankirtan, but the Panchatattva standing with Lord Chaitanya and his four associates. That was on the side altar. And Prabhupada would sit on his dais um, in the front. So the devotees would take turns um, offering the arti, one minute each devotee, and pass it on to the next one in line. Then after the program, uh, somebody brought the candle up to the altar room, and I would clean the altar room. So one day, the candle was all the way down at the bottom, and I shook it, and I put a piece of paper over it, I put my hand over it, I waved over it, and the, and the um, candle wouldn't go out. So Prabhupada was standing by, by the candle, and he said, why don't you blow on it? So I said, well, I thought we're not supposed to blow on anything. So he said, when there's no other alternative, then it's all right. Then I kept cleaning, and my leg brushed against these tall gladiola plants that he had um, around his oval altar. And I turned to him and said, um, I just touched the plant with my leg. Should I offer obeisances? Because it was the plants of the altar. And he said, yes. Prabhupada didn't uh, teach me, now you say this, now you say that, or sell in this way. Once I told Prabhupada, the devotees are asking me how to sell the books. Hmm? What is the technique? And he said, what do you tell them? I said, I tell them Prabhupada that that, that you had to follow all the, the principles very, very strictly and read and chant and he said, yes, this is our only technique. Hmm? In other words, preaching is the overflow, really, of the culture. Hmm? 
in your culture, then it, it, nicely it overflows and then you have something to say and feel inspired. Mm -hmm. So no, he never gave me any kind of advice in that way, but uh, from internal inspiration, from wanting to please him, then I think he used me in his service, in that particular service and for, for preaching and book distribution. So, so then he asked us, he said, can you quote me this verse? So the two of us looked at each other. You know, I was looking at him, I thought, all right, tomorrow Krishna goes to him, he'll quote the verse. And he was looking at me and he thought, Bhagavad will do it. <laughs> Neither of us knew the verse. Then Prabhupada said, just see, you are not reading my books. He said, every day you have to read my books. You have to study my books and learn my books, just like a lawyer learns the law books. He said, you must know everything, chapter and verse. He said, if you do not know, how will you preach? How will you teach these men unless you know my books? Every day you have to read my books. And he said, do you know that every day even I read my own books? So both of us were looking at it. He said, do you know why I read my books? So again, we didn't, you know, we didn't want to venture any answers because we already realized we were in a lose-lose situation. <laughs> it was like nothing we could say was going to be right. So he said, I read my books every day because even I learn something new when I read my books. He said, do you know why I learn something new when I read my books? He said, because these are not my books. I do not write these books. And he spoke, when he started to speak at this moment, it was like something came over him. It was like so mystical. He said every morning, he had his hand up like this. You know how Prabhupada used to put up his hand like this? Every morning, when I sit here to read my books, to, to write my books, Krishna comes personally and he dictates to me what to write. He said, and so I simply take dictation from Krishna. And I write these books. He said, therefore, when I read them, even I learn something. And it was like so dramatic the way he said it. And we just felt the weight. And I, you know, I was sitting there, I was thinking, I'm speaking with the person who's speaking with God. He's there. He's right next to God. I'm only one person removed from God. It's so close. And yet I knew, because of my own, the state of my own consciousness, how far away I actually was. But that by some grace, I was being placed just right next to God by being with Prabhupada. It was just so amazing. Prabhupada, uh called me into his room in 1967 in New York. The devotees from Boston, and I was one of them, came down to see him. And after his darshan, he called me in and handed me one print, about that big, of Radha and Krishna and the eight gopis. And he asked me to make a big canvas of that, really big, like four feet by five feet. And he began explaining from the Brahma Samhita how, um, we didn't know the Brahma Samhita then, but how the um, palaces are all made of touchstones and the cows give nectar-like milk that fulfill everyone's desire and the ground is muddy with the milk of the cows and the trees are wish-fulfilling trees that supply all eatables upon anyone's demand. And the gopis, they, the associates of Radharani, they serve Radharani and Krishna by fanning them and singing and dancing and offering them foodstuffs. So I couldn't relate that much to the exalted description, 
But as I was looking at the um, print, my only response to all that beauty, beautiful words, was, how come the gopis aren't looking at Radha and Krishna? Shouldn't they be looking? Because they're looking in different ways, holding their serving paraphernalia. So Prabhupada said, when you're dancing, you don't always have to look. And then um, he told me to make um, Krishna a little bit smaller. He said, Krishna looks a little fatty there, fatty, and he's too tall, so make him a little thinner and shorter. And then uh, I said, those flowers there, they're all blobs, because the artist hadn't made uh, details. What flower should I put there? So he said, you can take any flower and transport it to Vrindavan. And then um, I said, I heard that Krishna's eyes are red. Sometimes we hear the red lotus eyes. So he said, red dish. Then he said, reddish black. And then I, I asked him, well, you say that Krishna is the color of a fresh rain cloud, but what color exactly is that? So Prabhupada um, uh, started, he lowered his head, and then he put his hand up on his head like this, and he gradually brought his head up and his hand down, and then by the time his hand was like this, he said, they say Krishna is the color of a fresh rain cloud, but I do not know what color that is which, you know, in, in his great humility, he showed that he really knows not only from scripture, but from realization. One amazing thing about him is that, just like if I'm looking at your camera here, I don't have to be very intelligent to describe your camera. It's black, and it has these legs on it, and it's made of metal, because I'm seeing it for what it is, and I'm an ordinary person. So with Prabhupada, um, even an ordinary person could look at him and hear him say simple things or give simple gestures and get great realizations about the nature of a pure devotee because he emanated the truths about him. It was emanated just by his glance or his words. So just by him saying that, you could feel that he um, can see Krishna. He taught about Krishna Leela, of course, also when we used to venture the question about Rasa Tattva to Prabhupada. More often than not, he would answer to the effect, why don't you go there and find out? Hmm. What I can tell you about that, that is something, but what will you know by my speaking about it? Uh, by your grasping onto it intellectually, not that it shouldn't be talked about. And of course, it, it is in his books, and he does talk about it within certain parameters and, and so forth. But knowing, really knowing, will be by going, going there. And that means through service and sacrifice. And we hope, really, that devotees will be inspired for that, and newcomers as well, to serve his, uh, his message. And then know him, really, because it's a big subject, Prabhupada. Some knew him as Swamiji, and then when he said, now there will be initiations, some didn't want to know him any further than that. They didn't want to take it any further. And gradually, gradually, he came out in terms of his mission and what it was about, and some people stayed on, and some people decided, well, that's enough for me. And we should try to go the limits, and it will require unlimited service and sacrifice, the set, likes of which he personally exemplified in relation to Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur. Prabhupada, one of his characteristics was that he took the suggestion of his guru as an order. <laughs> he used to say, my guru Maharaj ordered me, if you ever get money, sell books, print books. No, it's not that he ordered him, really. If you look at the history, he, he mentioned it to him. He wrote in a letter, it might be good for you and others if you speak in English. And I think at Radha Kund it was, Prabhupada told him, if you ever get, Prabhupada, Prabhupada Bhakti Siddhanta told our Prabhupada Bhakti Vedanta, if you ever get money, print books. And, and Prabhupada took it as an order, a suggestion. In this commentary on Vyavasayatnika Buddhyeke Hakurunandana, this verse from Bhagavad Gita, one mindedness of uh, fixed intelligence required for spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Then he quotes in his purport, Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur's Guru Vastak, Yasya Prasada, Bhagavat Prasada, Yasya Prasada, Nagati Kutopi. So this was his idea of one-mindedness, mm -hmm. to um, serve us to the order of Guru. And the order of Guru to him was a suggestion. Mm -hmm. He took it as order and life and soul. <laughs> 
So he's very extreme on this point. If we can follow that example of Guru Nishta, then I think we can know him really and substantially as he is. I notice, I do it myself, and I hear everybody else do it who had any experience with Prabhupada. When they would talk about some conversation that they had with him, they said, and he looked at me and said, or, and he looked at me slowly and said, or he looked at me quickly and said. And nobody says that when they're talking about somebody. They just said, the person says. So it meant that if Prabhupada just casually or in any way looked at us even quickly, it had tremendous significance. Um, so I felt very similar to other devotees that he wasn't just seeing my dress as this body, but he was seeing the soul inside. Um, and he was seeing me, although I couldn't see me, and it was almost embarrassing. But it was, it was not embarrassing in the sense if, if you know that somebody knows all your faults, and they look at you, and you know they know, it's embarrassing. But this was beyond that, because you knew that not only was he seeing beyond the body, but he was seeing beyond the faults and beyond the interactions of the modes of nature and all the coverings. But he was seeing the soul proper, which was so full of wonderful qualities. So it was embarrassing and then beyond embarrassing, just blissful when he would glance. And um, like we hear stories of Krishna when he would take um, lunch with his coward boys and everybody would be thinking that, well, he's just looking at me and it's just me and him. And that's how it was with so many of us with Prabhupada. If you have ten people in the room with him, they'll each have a personal story of the same moments. <laughs> so um, there were a few experiences that I had with Prabhupada's glance, uh, that one that I just mentioned. And then another one, I had just finished uh, the painting, my very first painting of Radha and Krishna and the cow, which he told me to copy from the the cover of the Bhagavatam that he brought from India. So that was hanging in his, um, in his altar room, and he called me into his greeting room because some young men, young gentlemen, Indians, had come to speak with him. And he offered them a, some kind of maha sweet. And before they ate it, they put it to their head, and we had never done that before. So he glanced at me and carried me, <laughs> my eyes, over to them. And so I watched them and saw how he was indicating that we should be respectful to Prashadam. One day, Satsarupa couldn't do Prabhupada's massage. I had been sitting in the room when he mentioned this. You know, Satsarupa Maharaj said, I, I won't be able to do your massage today, and, our, and whoever else it was wouldn't be available. So, uh, I looked up at Srila Prabhupada and I said, well, I have very big hands and I am strong. I can give you a good massage. So uh, Prabhupada said, uh, okay. He said, you can do that. You give me a massage. So and I came up and I was massaging Srila Prabhupada. And, you know, everyone told me you have to massage him strong. Yeah, so I'm massaging him, you know. I'm doing his head, and he said, in a very deep voice, which I, it shook me to the core of my being, you are doing it too hard. I, I was shocked, you know. So I tried to lighten up a little bit, you know, but. I was massaging his whole body. And during the course of the massage, I remember these ants were coming. And they started to, like, go to climb on his feet. So I stopped massaging him, and I'm going like this and like this to, like, move the ants. So Prabhupada looked and said, what are you doing? Why have you stopped the massage? I said, oh, there's some ants, Srila Prabhupada, they're coming on your feet. So he looked over and he said, they will not bother me. They will go away by themselves. And he, he just waved his hand over the ants. Now, there must have been 20 or so ants and they were all like in a disorganized pile, ready to 
get up on his mat and onto his feet. And he waved his hand over them. And I swear, these ants immediately got into a single file line and marched in the opposite direction. And I thought, oh, unbelievable. He has like complete control over nature. You know, it's like <laughs> whatever he wills happens. And, uh, you know, I finished the massage and everything. But I could, I could tell Prabhupada felt I was like doing it a little too hard. So a couple of days later, when we're on the Krishna book, the morning walk, and they're reading the Krishna book, so they're reading about Krishna's fighting with the wrestlers. So it said, and these two wrestlers came out, and they were both fully grown men with bodies like solid slabs of stone. Prabhupada stopped. He picked up his cane, and he stuck it out, and he pointed it to me, and he said, you... You are like those wrestlers. <laughs> and everyone laughed. You know? <laughs> I never massaged Prabhupada again. <laughs> Suffice to say. And he said, but you just keep hearing, it doesn't matter what your material qualification or disqualification is, just keep hearing submissively and everything will come and God will become fully realized to you. And we had that faith. Um, and he would give many arguments defeating the Mayavadis, which helped me tremendously. Like the Mayavadis say, um, you become silent. Now you're talking so much, but when you become self-realized, you become God and you become silent. And they give the example of a water jug. When you're filling it up, it goes gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. And then when it's full, it's silent. So he said the Mayavadis give this kind of argument, but if they're giving an analogy, analogy means that there are many similar points, but there's no similar point here. Because is the living entity a water jug? Am I, can I be compared to a water jug? Uh, he said, in the scriptures it says, Atato Brahma Jigyasam, now real talking begins. Now that you've passed through all the lower species and come to human life, now it's time to talk about the human subjects. Or he'd say that the Mayavadis say that, um, I'm God. So I would say to him, Oh, you're a God? How you have become dog? Well, I'm God, but I've just forgotten. Okay, you may be that, you may be God, but you're not that God that doesn't forget. So in this way, he would play both sides. Um, and then uh, Purushottam and I worked in Prabhupada's quarters. Achyutananda did also, but he worked in the kitchen. And uh, Purushottam would be cleaning and I would be painting. So after class and after the breakfast, he'd come into the altar room where we worked and he'd say, okay, what did I say in class? And I would say, well, uh, God is everything, but everything is not God, or is it that everything is God, but God is not? And then he would continue speaking. And he would say, the greatest illusion is to think that I'm God, and LSD is the greatest, greatest illusion because it puts you in that foolish frame of mind. So we got the lectures and his personal discussions and hearing from uh, all the devotees. And I mean, he even instructed me one time because um, he would wash his laundry in, the, in his bathtub. And the devotees who lived downstairs, they also did that. And Prabhupada instructed me one day when I came up to paint, don't use washing machines. They're not nice. So little instructions here and there. Another time in Bombay during this period, this devotee brought two of these uh, Swami Narayan sannyasis to see Prabhupada. And in the Swami Narayan, a sannyasi is never allowed to look even at the face of a woman. If they do, they have to fast the next day. So it's like, in the temples, the Swami Narayan temples, the, the women are behind a curtain that no one can see beyond that curtain. They have to just listen from the other side. So we brought them up to Prabhupada's room, and at the time, he was in the room with Jasomati Nandan 
and Jasomati Nanan's elderly mother. I mean, the woman must have been 70 years old. She was just an old, wrinkled Indian woman. And Prabhupada was talking with her. And so the two sannyasi, we open the door and they look and they see this old woman and they cover their faces and, you know, they became very disturbed. So we said, well, just wait, you know, Prabhupada will be finished soon and then you can. So they went back downstairs and they waited in this room and then uh, the woman came out and we went upstairs again. And I, I told Prabhupada, I said, the Swami Narayan sannyasis are here and they have a rule in their Parampara, never to look at the face of a woman when you take sannyas. So they saw Yasamati Nandan's mother, they wouldn't come. He said, okay, okay, so you bring them, I, I will talk with them. So we brought them up and they come and they sit in front of Prabhupada and Prabhupada says, I'm so sorry. He was very respectful. Them. So I'm so sorry, he said, but it was my one of my leading students' elderly mother who came to see me. So I gave her some of my time while he was present in the room. And my servant was here, my sannyasi servant. But he said, oh, but we do not, we do not see. We do not. All right, he said. Lord Chaitanya was very strict, I understand. So then Prabhupada started to ask them questions about their religion. And immediately, the confrontation began. <laughs> and they started saying that the Swami Narayan, he was God. And so he said, so where is it in Srimad Bhagavatam that Swami Narayan is God? Where is it stated Swami Narayan is coming? I have not seen. I have seen Rama. I have seen the Shringa. I have seen Varaha. I have seen Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. All are stated there in Bhagavatam. But where is Swami Narayan? No, no, it is there in this book. I don't know what, what book is that? Who has written that book? It is Vedas? It is written by Vyas? No, such and such Swami. Oh, that Swami. Who is he? And what Parampara he is from? And Prabhupada was showing us how to preach. And he was going on and on. And he was just hammering these. And just... He wasn't going to let them go for a second. They had tried to embarrass him by making him feel like he was less than them because he was talking to an elderly woman. And he was going to show them that he was transcendental to talking to an elderly woman <laughs> because he knew the philosophy that they didn't understand. And he cut them to ribbons. And they walked out of there. It was like their heads had been in a ping pong game. They had been completely worked over. So they said, okay, well, we're going to leave, Swamiji. <laughs> We've had enough now. <laughs> and they got up and they walked out. And I was hysterical. I said, Srila Prabhupada, you are the greatest. I said, just see how every question and they, you just, then I started going on and on and on. And then I, Prabhupada said, oh, so you appreciate it? <laughs> said, yes, yes, I was so, you, you, just everything that they said, you had an answer for, and you had a verse, and you said everything. He said, yes, this is the way to preach. So, you like this preaching? I said, oh, yes, you are the greatest, Srila Prabhupada. No one can defeat you. You are the best. <laughs> and I said, oh, so you think so. No, no, not just I think. And everyone was going there, or everyone was in the room. They were like, yes, Prabhupada is the best. Prabhupada is the greatest. <laughs> I said, oh. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> so he was just enjoying that, you know, he was being humble, but he was enjoying the whole thing. <laughs> it was in the early 70s, and we were not only painting Krishna then, but we were painting for the Bhagavatam. So there are many incarnations. Now Krishna is very distinctive. He's blue, and he wears a peacock feather, and he has a yellow dhoti. So even if it's a bad painting, you know that's Krishna. Um, but then there are kings, like King Prithu, who is a general-looking king, as far as we know. He has a mustache. Prabhupada told us 
just how to paint kings, how to paint sages, like kings have no beard but only a small mustache. And uh, we couldn't even imagine that a king could be a Vaishnava because we thought that only if you were a dhoti, then, you ha then you're a Vaishnava. But he said kings with helmets were also Vaishnavas. So descriptions of kings like King Prithu or ladies, Brahminical ladies like Mother Sachi, was general. There can be many Brahmin ladies who look like that. So I wrote to Prabhupada and asked, um, it's easy to understand that Krishna is in his picture because he's distinctive. But when you have somebody like King Prithu or Sachi Mata, how are they in their pictures? So Prabhupada wrote back that um, they are present by your consciousness. That is, if, if we're thinking that it's them and we're painting not by concoction, but from his authorized instructions, and especially if it's in his book, then they're actually present. So many, sometimes we learn instructions in a positive way like that, and sometimes we learn in a negative way. Negative way means by the uh, school of hard knocks. For example, um, in the early 70s, I did a painting for the cover of Adi Lila Volume 3 of the uh, Lord Chaitanya Sankirtan party coming to the house of Chan Kazi. And I had Lord Nityananda playing Amardanga, and I painted it all in. And then I asked him, is that all right? And he said, he doesn't play Amardanga. And, um, and then I had to ask him so many questions that if I was a normal reader of his books, a normal, even a normal devotee reader, I wouldn't have thought to ask. But because we had to do so many details, and not all the details were in the manuscript, we had to ask him so many questions. What does Ramananda Rai look like? How old is he? Does he have hair? Was he sannyasi? So many questions about so many of Krishna's associates and Lord Chaitanya's associates. And he would patiently answer hundreds and hundreds of questions. So Rabon Bhattacharya is such and such years old, and Ramananda Rai is in his 40s. One question, so-and-so wears a saffron dhoti. So, so many instructions like that. Um, and uh, I asked about Lord Chaitanya's, uh, Lord Nityananda's sannyas, and Prabhupada said he never took sannyas, so we knew then not to paint him the same way we'd paint Lord, Nit Lord Chaitanya as sannyasi. Um, in the original Krishna book, um, Prabhupada used Devahuti Prabhu's painting of Ras Lila, which she had copied from an Indian print. Very, not so realistic, a little stylistic, but very dignified, very nice. And then I thought, uh, we were doing the third canto, and there was another description of the Ras Lila. So I thought, well, surely I'll make a more realistic one than Devahuti did, with proper lighting and realistic folds of the cloth, and this will be so much better than Devahuti's. So we went through a great endeavor. Merle Varana was the BBT photographer at that time. And he took about 10 or 15 devotees in a van to uh, some park, big park in New York. And the devotees posed for the Rasa dance. And the, the girls had their hair long, and Krishna has his hair long, and moving around things were flowing, as we would imagine they would have been, if they were dancing. And then um, Merle Vadana took the pictures and it went in the book. And when Prabhupada saw the Bhagavatam, he said, this ruined my whole book. <laughs> he said, this, you have made it like a hippie play thing. And Jadarani is a hippie rascal. Um, he said, Devahudis was w much more dignified the Ras Lila is Krishna's smiling face. You know, the different cantos go up his body. Smiling face. And you have uh, made it just like a plaything. So in that way we got that kind of instruction in a negative way. I was in Los Angeles and we had reasoned that, <clears throat> in particular, in order to go to the airport and distribute literature, which was illegal at the time, we couldn't go dressed in, in uh, devotional attire. and. So we reasoned that we should put on some secular clothing and uh, try to go in a covert way. 
And I remember the first time we went, three of the devotees who had gone with me had been, were arrested, either arrested or told to cease and desist or be arrested. And I managed to um, get through the day without being apprehended. At the time I thought, oh, what a wonderful facility this is. By standing in one place, you can send Prabhupada's literature all over the world. I prayed to Prabhupada at that time that this facility could become available for us for distributing books. I think my prayer came true. And so many then airports at that time facilitated our distribution, even if it was a little unwilling on their part. But um, then a debate came that actually I think it was Kirtananda Swami was with Prabhupada in, in India and he was he was registering the complaint that these devotees are wearing secular clothing and and so forth and he seemed to think that it was a compromise of the principle or that they were regressing. Hmm? So Prabhupada wrote to, to us in Los Angeles, he was quite concerned and we had a little meeting and uh, and then we responded back, it's not that we're regressing, we have no interest in wearing these clothes whatsoever. And I would never go before Prabhupada with the secular clothing on. That was my principle. I had no interest in that clothing. But for the service of Krishna, if it would increase the distribution, then we would accept. When we explained that to Prabhupada, that was our mood, he could perceive through the letter, then he sanctioned that. And ultimately he tried hard to find precedences for this principle, especially for the sannyasis. And he held off on that also for some time. I remember Seth Rupmarsh wanted to wear secular clothing to distribute books to the libraries and Prabhupada discouraged it. And, and when I was first recommended for sannyas, without asking, um, Ramaswar had uh, written to Prabhupada, he wanted that I would be able to take sannyas, that I had more influence in the society. And Prabhupada wrote back that actually he doesn't need to take sannyas, he's already doing more than any sannyasi. That made many sannyasis wonder, what is he doing? And uh, they came to me and asked, how are you pleasing Prabhupada by selling the books and so forth? And um, I think that was just Prabhupada's generous statement to encourage me, I think. He wrote it to Ramaswar, who had written him, and, and they said, in any way, besides that, it is against the etiquette of the sannyasis to, to wear the secular clothing, as he must do sometimes. But later he, he changed that principle, the principle being that the sannyasi, and really the brahmacharis too, who commit themselves in this way, they shouldn't wear secular clothing. It, it means going back to the secular lifestyle. But he found some precedence as he kind of stretched it to, to establish that, uh, that uh, policy that it was based on scripture. I think he cited Narada Muni preaching in a covert way to, to Prahlad while he was in the womb and in Chaitanya Charitamrita, also something in regards to Prataprudra Maharaj changed his clothes and in order to get the association of Mahaprabhu. He changed from secular dress to devotional dress to get Mahaprabhu's association while he was a king. So, as I say, it's kind of stretching it, but the real principle, of course, is for the sannyasi is to um, do the needful for preaching. And uh, so there was a controversy about that and ultimately Prabhupada sided with the dynamic idea of making adjustment for preaching rather than sticking to the form. So he was not a man of form, but a man of substance. Not a man, but a, uh, a great devotee. I was sitting with Srila Prabhupada on the top of the roof uh, above his apartment in Bombay. And it was in the evening and we sat there I think up until we were alone, just he and I. I don't remember whether it was an hour or two hours. It, it appeared timeless. And we had been on that roof until maybe 10 or 11 o'clock at night alone. And we were just talking. And he was telling me about Indian history, about Gandhi. And he said that Gandhi had the proper plan for revitalizing India. And he started to explain, he said, Gandhi never wanted big cities. He never wanted factories to open up. He never liked that. He said that Gandhi was concerned 
that people had the basic necessities of life in the villages. And that his plan was to first arrange for everyone to have food, clothing, education, good water supply, religious training, and some occupation, a craft, making cloth or jewelry or something of that nature. He said that these were the basic principles that Gandhi <clears throat> lived by. And he felt that if in every village the basic needs of the people were met through the simple self-sufficient principles, that then later on, if they wanted to develop some factories here and there, that that could be done. He said, but, uh, he said, Sadr Patel and Nehru, they betrayed him. That was his opinion, that was his vision of it. He said, they saw that India's future was through factories. <clears throat> that they would bring in all these factories and things of that nature and create jobs for everyone. He said, now look what has happened. So all these young men have left their landed property. They are not growing food anymore. They have come to the cities. They are living in shanty towns. They are living in squalor, working in the factory for only a few rupees, not making enough money even for a living. He said they've spoiled everything. And then he started to lament. He was lamenting. He said, India has become spoiled by all of this Western civilization. He said, I wanted, Gandhi wanted simple life. He said, that is the real way. He said, just self-sufficient life. He said, Chitaranjan Das, he also wanted. And then he became like, I never seen him like this. And he said, I loved Gandhi. I loved Chitaranjan Das. They wanted to save India. He said, but it was all spoiled by these politicians. And then the next morning, we were on the morning walk. And we were walking down the beach. And I was on one side of Srila Prabhupada. And usually when some people would come to enter into the march <laughs> down the beach, Prabhupada would turn to them as a respect and he would bow and offer his respect like this, like that. He was always, Prabhupada was always the gentleman, the perfect gentleman. And so when we walked, we seemed to be walking an extraordinarily long distance. I mean, he never usually walked this far down the beach. And at a certain point, I saw him finally go like this. Now, I was on this side of him, and he had turned this way and went like this. And so I turned to look to see who was coming, and there was nobody. But in the distance, there was the statue of Gandhi with his stick standing there. Prabhupada had walked this entire distance to get down there to offer some respect to this statue of Gandhi. As, at least as I had perceived, because there was nobody there. And he had turned to go like this. And we were, everyone was looking to see what he was doing. Now, nobody else had been with me the night before, so it dawned on me why he had done what he did. I knew why. Nobody else knew. So then, we turned around and we walked back and some other people came. And by divine arrangement, someone started talking about Gandhi. 
And Prabhupada turns to him and he said, what is this idea of Gandhi? This is all nonsense. Gandhi is this, this is that, and then he on and on and on. And, on. and then he turned and he looked at me and he smiled. And I thought, this is a little secret that he had shared with me. I felt so honored. But at the same time, he's letting me know, you have to know what to say and when to say it and how to say it in order to preach this philosophy. And so he was letting me know that, he was showing me that. Because he knew that I knew what was going on when he did what he did that morning and from the night before. But he wanted me to also be aware how to preach. For the Chaitanya Charitamrita marathon, we asked him maybe a thousand questions, many, many letters. Not only letters, but um, because Prabhupada was traveling around the world, and you have a two-month marathon, and each book has to come out in a week, you can't start writing to India and wait for the letters back. So sometimes Ramaswara would call in the questions and ask Paramahamsa, Swami, who was Prabhupada's secretary, he would ask Prabhupada the questions, call Ramaswara back, and then Ramaswara would bring the messages back to us. Sometimes I would write the questions in my handwriting, and um, somebody would be going to India, like Nitai would be going to India to bring one of the volumes to show Prabhupada that it was already published. And then Prabhupada would give the answers, and they would write a one or two word answer in between my handwritten lines. And that would come back by another devotee who had just come back from India. So everything was going very fast. And we'd ask him maybe a thousand questions at that time. But now in 69, we asked some questions for each painting. So Prabhupada was very encouraging and he said, if you discuss it amongst sel yourselves and use your discretion, that will be better than asking me. In the same letter, he answered one of our questions to show that asking Prabhupada is better than using our own discretion. And that is, we were doing the painting of Krishna fighting with Jamavan. Now in the Krishna book, Jamavan is addressed as the king of the gorillas and also as Riksharaj, which means king of the bears. So the question was, is Jamavan a gorilla or a bear? And Prabhupada answered back that um, he's neither a gorilla nor a bear. Um, just like somebody may be named Krishna Das or Krishna, but that doesn't mean that he's Krishna. <laughs> so he may be called the king of the bears or gorillas, but that doesn't mean he's a gorilla. Otherwise, how could his daughter Jambavati have been beautiful enough to become Krishna's wife? Then he said, he was like a big, strong man of your country. Um, so in this way, we got further instructions about Krishna consciousness through Krishna consciousness also in our knowledge of, that we're fully dependent on Prabhupada to know anything. We had the first African disciples at that time. There was a, three or four of them living with Srila Prabhupada, living in the, in the house with Prabhupada. And so Prabhupada one day called for Brahmananda to come to the room and he said, where are my clothes? So Prabhupada said, well, I don't know what happened. He said, well, yesterday the, the servant came, the African servant, I gave him my clothes to wash and he said he would bring them in. So then they called the African servant, so he came in, he said, where are my clothes? So he said, I don't know. I, I washed them, I put them on the line, and now they're gone. So, Prabhupada said, oh, someone has stolen my clothes? So Brahmananda said, uh, well, sometimes there's thieves and we didn't have the back door locked, so maybe they came in and stole the clothes because Prabhupada had all these silk clothes. Well, they must have thought it was valuable and stole it. So Prabhupada laughed, he said, oh, they are stealing even these pieces of silk from a sannyasi. What? <laughs> so he had two of the uh, shoulder pad, the thing, the shoulder uh, 
pieces of cloth. So he, he put one over the top and the other one on the bottom and his legs were sticking through. It was very uncomfortable. So then the next morning, he has Bhagavatam class and all the African disciples come in to sit down and hear Prabhupada give Bhagavatam class. Well, Prabhupada's sitting there looking at the book and he looks up and he says, you're wearing my shirt. You're wearing my dhoti. You're wearing my top. You're wearing... And Brahmanan got furious. He started just robing them in front of Prabhupada. He's taking off the shirts. He's taking off the dhotis. They're going, get what you took the spiritual master's clothes. What's the matter with you? And Prabhupada was laughing and laughing. Prabhupada was hysterical. He's just sitting there like, oh, they're taking my clothes. Look, there. <laughs> he thought it was actually humorous that they were all wearing his clothes. Twice I wrote to him and I asked him if I could just be a Sankirtan devotee. And twice he wrote back, no, that uh, your specific talent is painting. So you should do that. But um, even in spiritual life, variety makes one more fit for work. So you can go on Sankirtan sometimes. Then in 1974, when Prabhupada was making so many letters of glorification to the book distributors, I also started feeling really left out. You know, he would say that just two devotees, he wrote one letter, I think, to the Chicago temple that only two devotees, and at that time devotees meant there were 150 devotees in the temple, only two devotees should stay back and take care of the deities and everyone else should go out on book distribution, everyone should go out all day and then come back for one meal a day and um, right or wrong, I never questioned my spiritual master and he always stressed this book distribution, so I was pretty glum. And at that time again I wrote to him and asked if we could do that and he said, just because I write something to one person it doesn't mean that it's the same for everybody. Making pictures for the books is the same as distributing them. So he always rejected my proposals. There were some other things that happened. I remember they interviewed Prabhupada because he had been at a um, big pondo. And so the BBC was interviewing him. And what had happened was that previously, just before he had started the lecture program, the um, country next to us Tanzania, the communists had taken over and they had a midnight session of Congress and the next day there was a law passed that no one owned property in the state of Tanzania anymore. All the property was now owned by the state and you had to pay rent to the state. And you had no ownership. And Prabhupada was furious. He said that this was tantamount to, uh, this was thievery. This was out and out stealing. That people work hard, they, they earn money, they buy property, they develop an estate, and then the government just steals it from them like rogues. He said these are the worst rogues and thieves and rascals, he said. And at that time, the BBC, one day, during this, they interviewed him. And they said, uh, you know, what is your message? And he started talking about, he said, my message is that I want to kick out all these rogues and rascals and thieves and these politicians. They're all rascals, he said. There are no good politicians. They're all rogues. The whole world is filled with rogues and thieves. They are stealing the hard-earned money of the people. They are stealing their land. They are stealing their lifeblood. He said, they're bloodsuckers. And Prabhupada was so vehement. He said, a real king is the protector of the people. He said, a real king will see that everyone is living nicely, that all people have food, that all people have clothing, that all people have care and attention and medical needs. Everything that is needed will be provided by the king. The king takes so much care and responsibility that if anyone dies, he feels personally responsible that they have died too young 
or if the son dies before the father, he feels that it is personal responsibility for such events. And here these men, they are just stealing. He said there are no qualified people to be king in this world. We need a qualified king. He should have honesty and decency and integrity. And Prabhupada was talking about all the qualities of a king, like Maharaj Yudhisthira, like Ram, like, you know, and he was going on and on. So the man said, do you see that there's anybody in the world that has such qualifications that, that could be king of the world? And just when he said that, the guy who had the videotape, the tape ran out. But the guy who was interviewing didn't know it. And Prabhupada looked at him, put his cane on the ground, and he said, yes, me. Just like that. And he was qualified to be king of the world. And the look on the interviewer's face was <laughs> a complete shock. But Prabhupada realized that nobody else in the world had the qualifications, that only the pure devotee could do this. Then he came, led by a kinchin of Krishna Das Babaji when I was there, um, a month or so before he departed. And, and Prabhupada said, so now, now, please forgive me for all my offenses. Now the war is over. You please try to help them hmm? in Krishna consciousness. And Babaji Maharaj was quick to say, no, no, you have not offended anyone. But all you have done in the name of Guru Maharaj in preaching, you cannot make offense. Hmm? It was very charming, very endearing. And you know, Prabhupada would speak harshly about his God brothers. And you have to understand that why, for what reason, circumstance, time. Some of them were inimical, but even the inimical ones there was one who was inimical at, at, at one time in Prabhupada's estimation. And Prabhupada sent me to, his, to honor his Vyasa Puja in Vrindavan. Mm -hmm. After he had departed and the Vyasa Puja was being celebrated, Prabhupada sent me with some of the sannyasis to go and observe that. I thought, I thought Prabhupada didn't like this fellow. So that doesn't run very deep, mm -hmm. really. What runs deep in the heart of Prabhupada or any Param Vaishnav, Shuddha Vaishnav, like that is love. Mm -hmm. So to speak of loving people in general, devotees, and devotees of the same banner, God brothers, hmm? this we should know, we should understand this, because we have readily our own experience now amongst our God brothers' differences. We may speak strongly about one another, hmm? but if, if we're carrying on nicely with the mission, we also must have some deep appreciation for those who are also carrying on, and, and a tear for those who are not. Hmm? We're not against them. <laughs> So, I think that Prabhupada very much demonstrated this, and if we didn't see that, we didn't see Prabhupada. Hmm? As much as he criticized some of them, he loved them very deeply, and it came out at different times. And if you know the philosophy, then you know, he was not just a politician, just patronizing, going saying something nice about this one or that one. Hmm? When he glorified the Keshav of Marsh with a tear in his eyes, at the at notification of the disappearance of Keshav Marsh from the world, I think in 1969, Prabhupada was in Seattle. He got a telegram of his disappearance from the world. He gave a talk with tear in his eye about Keshav Maharaj, and he, he cited the verse of Das Goswami to uh, glorifying how Sanatana Goswami had taken him out, hmm, of uh, dragged him forcibly to a, such a life of renunciation. So he had deep feelings for them, deep love. Once in Boston, um, he was telling me something, something brilliant. Um, I was sitting in his darshan room, and I said, Gee, Swamiji, you know everything. So he said, unless one knows everything, how can he be a teacher? <laughs> and then another time he was saying something brilliant, and I said the same thing. You know everything. So he put his head down and he said, I have done nothing extraordinary. I am simply a canvasser for the disciplic succession. <laughs> one morning he was talking with us about his vision of what he wanted to do with the Siskan movement. And he said that he wanted to first buy all the land in Mayapur and establish a self-sufficient community in which they were completely independent of any needs from outside of the entire island of Mayapur. He said once that was established, he would then declare independence from India and secede from the country 
and make his own country the country of Mayapur. He said, and then his temples around the world would become embassies for the country of Mayapur and the presidents would be ambassadors. He said, and then we would print our own money. One Chaitanya, he said, I will call them Chaitanyas. There will be one Chaitanya, five Chaitanyas, ten Chaitanyas. He said, and we will have our own currency. And then we will make devotional items and export them all over the world. And that will be our export business. And Prabhupada had a vision of his own country, his own embassy, his own ambassadors, his own monetary system, his own economic system, his own export production. I mean, sometimes we don't realize how big Prabhupada was actually thinking, how grand he wanted this mission to be. And I, I remember, when I remember these discussions, I think, Phew, you know, we're so far away from where he really wanted to take this movement, how much harder we really need to work. An example of his humility was um, when I was painting Lord Nishingadev, as I mentioned, that little picture, maybe it's two by three, didn't have details, but I did notice that it had a rug at the bottom. Lord Nishringadev and Ananta were both on an Indian rug. And I needed a reference for an Indian rug. I remember that there was a print of um, Sita, Ram, and Hanuman on Prabhupada's wall. Suppose I'm Prabhupada. And the picture was behind him up on the wall, and he was sitting on his mat. So he was working in the next room. So I very quietly tiptoed in not to bother him. And I wanted to look at the print, but it was a little far away unless I would step on Prabhupada's mat. I didn't want to step on the mat, so I was in front of the mat. But to see the picture good, I had to kind of like jump up and down. So Prabhupada looked at me, you know, what are you doing? So I said, well, I'm trying to see this picture as a reference for my painting, but I didn't want to step on your bed because he not only used it as a daytime mat for sitting on, but he also slept on it at night. So he just said, in Krishna's service, you can step on my head. And you can tell that was his whole, his whole frame of being, that he's willing to sacrifice anything to help others come to Krishna. For a person that had such a big campaign, so widespread, and in terms of Gaudi Vaishnavism, there was no wider, uh, far-spread campaign. I mean, he was practically on every continent where, where people live. He, his campaign went, and he was conducting like a great general, but in such an un unassuming way, with such humility. If you take his prayer upon arriving in America, signed the most, insi the most insignificant beggar, I think we see this, this spirit that, um, of humility that he had that caused the, uh, such a dispensation to come, come through him. It, uh, it always, I think, uh, amazed me or it, it stuck out in my mind how one would be so humble and have such a, usually the humble person gets nowhere. In other words, if you're humble, then you go nowhere. You have to get out there and assert yourself and so forth. And Prabhupada was humble in that he was not at all self-asserting, but asserting always on behalf of his Guru Maharaj and uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. A dynamic kind of humility, the kind that would allow him to sit on the seat and also chastise and, and give orders. But, um, but truly, humble to the order of his spiritual master, humble to the call of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wrote that Trinada Pisuni Chena, to be more humble than a blade of grass, it's not that he sat down, sat down to write some poetry, but when he read the environment, when he saw grass, he thought, 
I'm not humble. Look at the grass. It bends when you step on it. It doesn't talk back. When he saw the tree, he thought, oh, why couldn't I be tolerant like this? And we are seeing grass walking on it and seeing trees everywhere. How often this shloka comes to mind. But when Mahaprabhu looked at the world, this is, what he, this is what it said to him. This is what it dictated to him. And that is his message about chanting and Prabhupada <laughs> humility. If we go on, we go to the, you know, the next one. <laughs> Tolerance, how he could tolerate me. And that is certainly took a lot in all of us crude stock we came from. Humility, tolerance. I think this verse of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Shikshastakam, Trinata Peace and Ichina Turoda Peace, and Amani Namanadena, he showed respect to everyone, even while saying, I step on their head with shoes. He showed respect for them. He brought Krishna's attention to them by doing so. Sri Sarasri Thakur once remarked about Vrindavan Das Thakur, who says this in his book. Chaitanya Charitamrita Krishna Das Kaviras is so humble. If you chant my name, you'll be committing offense. <laughs> and Vrindavan Das Thakur says, if you don't take this up, then I step on your head with shoes. So Prabhupada used to say like that. Sarasri Thakur was once asked about it, how can he be humble? He's saying this. He said, no, if he does this, it's out of real respect for that person, out of their potential and how they're not taking advantage of that. And when a devotee speaks like this about someone, then Krishna goes to them and says, oh, my devotee has said this. He pays attention to him. You please forgive him. So it causes, draws Krishna's attention to that person. So even when he's speaking strongly and harshly, and that people, people felt it also. Prabhupada call, could call them a dog or nonsense. You are not a theologian. You cannot say who is God. What is this? You're not a teacher. You're a cheater. And uh, more often than not, they were charmed by that. Thank you.